recording so everybody can hear this. I'm not gonna write it down. So first of all, the report will look like the following. You're gonna put the name of the group in the first of the uh, experiment, followed by the members of the group. Everybody his name, the bronc ID, name, bronc ID, name, bronc ID, and email address. Then you will follow in the second part about you know contribution. So you will come and say that you know Muhammad, myself, I work 20% uh, of this project. I did this and I did this and I did that. I have a couple of uh, problems I faced while I was working. And this problem, one, two, three, I tried to fix them. And I fixed the first one for an instant by using this way. I fixed the second one by using that way, or I didn't fix it. Other people helped me to fix this problem and so on. Then you will go to describe the circuit as a circuit, like block diagram. And then you know you will start saying, oh, the block number one, the code is uh, represented like that. The, uh, the block number two, the code is represented like that. You instantiate everything together in one top file and you build it. Then you know you will write something about the test bench. Like how did you verify? Spell out the corner cases. What type of corner cases you had? Uh, how, how the test bench you wrote, it will cover the, the, um, the corner cases. Whether that you know the corner cases test have been passed or not, stuff like that. And you put the with form, of course, and a copy of the form. That makes sense? Then inside the, inside the um, GitHub, you're gonna say that, you know, for an instance, you know, uh, experiments A folder. And inside the folder, you will go ahead and you will, but you will put what? You will put the code in a, in, a, in a folder, in a subfolder, and you will put the report under another subfolder, it's called documents. And the readme uh, in the GitHub, you will describe exactly what was the experiment talking about. Should I repeat it again? Our, our report, would we send it to you or would we upload it to GitHub as well? Everything gonna be GitHub. Okay, thank you. But you know, while you are dis demonstrating, you know, we're gonna be on the, um, on the chat like now. Uh, you know, how many group we have so far? We have, uh, let me check, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, CBB. Uh, one second, just to be sure that how many group we have. Uh, <clears throat> 3300. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So we have eleven groups, okay? We have eleven groups. Every, you know, group A will be taking the first uh, 10 minutes of the lecture. Group B will be taking the 10 minutes, the second 10 minutes, and so on. That makes sense? Okay, so everybody, please, I'm gonna repeat everything I mentioned now step by step. First of all, how many groups do we have? We have 11 groups, right? Every single group will go into their GitHub account, the, the folder that I shared with you and all of you accepted the access, right? You will work together into the project. Then there inside the, inside the, the, the assigned uh, GitHub folder, you already have the rep repository. You're gonna go there, you will open a new folder and inside the folder we'll name it with the experiment and date it. So let's say experiment one underscore and the date. Inside that folder, you will make two subfolders. One uh, subfolder will be holding the, everything for the project perspective, like coding, RTL, and this bench, while the second folder will be responsible for holding all the documentations. That makes sense? What is ex inside the documentation? PDF report and uh, PowerPoint slides. So two, two files will be expected inside the documentation. The report will be having the title of the experiment underscore the date. And inside the report, in the beginning, you will list the name of the team members. 
every member will put his name, his email address, his Bronco ID, followed by the contribution of every single member in the team and the percentage of the total work. That makes sense? Then you will start describing the circuit from the circuit perspective, not from the, VH, uh, not from the Verilog perspective. We are here using Verilog for describing circuit. We are not just writing code. We are not even a software class, right? Then you will translate the blocks inside the circuit into code. So you will tell me, oh, we wrote this, we did this, you know, we use blocking here, we use non-blocking here, for what reason? So I can understand that you understand what I already said in the lecture, right? Then you will follow with what? A technical report. I'm gonna go through how can you pick up data from the reports, by the way. So a technical report showing all of the report information, like, you know, how many lookup tables you used, how many flip-flop did you use? How many VRAM did you use? All of the resources on the chip you used. That will be followed by the test bench pr uh, procedure. So what is a test bench procedure? You will isolate the, the corner cases of your circuit. So you have to write up a paragraph saying that, you know, the circuit based on the specification was designed like that. And, you know, we found out the corner cases would need to be stressing on it and the testing as follows. And you will just list all of the corner cases. Then you will show me in the test bench which parts cover the which corner case. It did it pass or not? That makes sense? If it is not clear, I can repeat. Is it clear? Yeah. Yes, Professor. By any chance, do you have an example report we can use as a template? Uh, I mean, there is, I'm not going to be, um, can you explain corner case? Yes, I will explain corner case. Uh, for the examples, you know, I'm not picky. I'm not going to tell you you have two double size uh, spaces and stuff like that. Just like a Word document here, just write them, you know. I'm a person really like IEEE for math. You know, in IEEE format, what do you do? Most of you guys are in IEEE chapter, right? A student chapter, I'm not, I think so, right? So in IEEE, how it works, normally they do double column, but you know, I don't, I don't want a double column. I want a single column, okay? Um, most likely they will make an abstract. You put a title, the name of the people, and abstract. Abstract describing what is exactly will be this report uh, covering. Then they will make an introduction, and after that, they will move forward. That's almost the same thing, right? Basically, because you're gonna put here a title, you know, the, or you know, the list of few members, you know, the con uh, uh, contributions, and then an introductionary part, say, call it introduction, describing the whole circuit as a circuit, and then, you know, the RTL code with the report synthesis uh, tool, and then, you know, the last part, they're gonna be test bench with corner cases. Uh, you know, I'm gonna leave it for you you know, the way that you would like to present it, you know, there is no problem. Because if, I get, if I'm gonna make it really, really like really hard on you, it will be too much. I don't want to put too much constraint on you. Don't forget, end of the day, once you will graduate, right? Once you will graduate from the school, you will be a free engineer. What does it mean? That means you can do anything you want because you already have the power of knowledge. And we have to help you to do this and practice this while you're a student. Make sense? So Christopher asked it for uh, corner cases. So what corner cases? I give you an example of corner case, Christopher. So imagine that you have a, a counter, right? And it's an up counter. What corner cases we, we could have? Corner case can ha happen in the, in the, in the, in the up counter is following. Did it, did it reset by zero or not? So I have to test whether that, you know, when the reset happened, it will be zero or not. That's one corner case. Did it actually reach the maximum of the counter? Let's say it's a four bit counter. So that means the maximum of this counter 15. That's another corner case. Um, does it go round back in a ring to zero after 15 or not? That's another corner case. Does that make sense, uh, Christopher?
Because, you know, maybe you counter, it looks in the beginning great. So, you know, it's say two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you said, oh, it's counting up to eight, nine, ten. That's perfectly fine. But then, you know, when you start demonstrate, you will find 15, it's jumped to 16. Then, you know, oh, product case failed. Any question? Professor, do we still have to take into account uh, edge cases as well? Yes, it's the corner cases. It's the same thing. You have to take it in the, uh, of course, in the test bench section, you have to write it. So before you start saying that I wrote a code for, v, uh, for Verilog using uh, whatever, you know, uh, test bench, you have to tell me what is the corner cases. Okay, thank you. So like, you know, I'm writing, I'm writing test bench for what? Just to write a test bench? No. We have to write a test bench to test something, right? To test what corner cases. So we have to spell out the corner cases. When you come to the Wednesday as a group for 10 minutes to present your work, demo itself, the thing is working on the board, is a 50% of the weight of the experiment. It's not the weight of the course, you know what I mean? Experiment, okay? Then the other 50% will be evaluating based on the, uh, how the report, you know, the percentage of your contributions and answering questions, uh, I'm gonna give it to you. That sounds good? By the way, you guys, why you don't use Slack? I haven't seen any type of activities on the Slack. There's too much, man. Cut us some Slack. <laughs> Here, see, you know, I mean, 3300, nobody there. Not so many of us like, come on, it's super cool, you know. You know why I'm actually giving you Slack? Because you know, IBM and Intel are using Slack. And I want all of you guys to be higher than IBM. One of my- So what do you want us to use Slack for exactly? Slack for study, sharing questions. Let's say that Khaled have a question regarding a corner case X. I doubt so that. Just send and say, dear popular 3300 folks, you know, uh, this corner case is like giving me a headache. What is your idea? Then other people will start listing uh, answers. Then later on, somebody else will have your question. He will just scroll up and he will just find a solution. And instead of going back and forth asking the same question. So in other words, it's just so that we don't ask you the questions. <laughs> you can ask me questions. There is no also problem. You already have oh, also my good. office hours, right? Yeah. You are more welcome that, you know, to come to my office hour based on the Calendly. You have 15 minutes, discuss with me a certain subject. I will be sure that, you know, to cover it. Definitely. Makes sense? So you have a Slack. From time to time, I look to the Slack. If I find all of you have the same question, maybe I can answer there. And then, you know, um, uh, office hours and during the class, is there something really, 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 really hard, you know, just like text me or message me and I will reply back uh, with, uh, with a solution. Okay, so now I give you a lot of time without labs, right? Which is good enough to build up your knowledge that you will use in the lab. So I expect that all of you have a board now, right? Super, so everybody has a board. Be sure, even if you don't have a board, to take a board like from a friend of you, you know, he already like, you know, has this course and you know, he doesn't need it for now or something like this. It's better for you to do stuff by your hand because it's like hands-on experience. Okay, Duke, I'm gonna go and launch Vivado. And from there, I'm gonna share with you multiple things, one of them is the how can you pick up resources out of the reports, like timing report, uh, resources utilization reports and stuff like that. Then I will show you also how can you instantiate logic analyzer on the chip so you don't need to waste your time buying your own logic analyzer. Then we'll start talking about the, the always block as a procedure block and with a couple of examples. And after that, if we have time, I will go ahead and give you the clock divider.
Is there any question so far? Shall we start? Everybody see Vivado? Yeah. Super. Uh, I need this here so I can see it. Okay, so now we're gonna start create a new project. Create a project. And let's call this one um, lecture uh nine nine twenty twenty and say yes we agreed together that this rtl project right an rtl project and then you know from there we're gonna say xc7 v whatever a no it was xa100 tc and then you know the speed is minus one i want you to look to carefully with me onto the screen and see something very important what is this long line um, in the row that in front of you belong to the chip on the board what is there it's telling you that you know the chip the chip you already have there which is this one right can you see it maybe i can go turn on the light one second the chip we have it has io ports what does it mean io ports that means the ports or the pins we are uh, getting data to the chip and getting data out of the chip right that's called io so imagine that you know the chip is surrounded by 324 of those even look it's really tiny right so imagine that guy he worked with the pcp wow he's amazing you know look 300 to, uh, 324 of them are all of those guys are accessible by you no some of them internally in the multi-layer of the bcb connected to something else but what is the accessible one we have basically the accessible one we have the switches accessible one we have are the seven segment display accessible one we have our leds accessible one we have the p mods accessible one we have the jtag which is the usb here micro usb and the uh, ethernet vga usb and of course there is a speaker here uh audio jack and a bunch of buttons as you can see or the uh, colored led and those completely the one is accessible are completely written in the xdc file we shared before do you agree so everybody know that you should know that xdc file have the accessible io ports coming out of the chip after the manufacturer put the chip on the board. Then they said out of this pen, there are 210 are available. So those are the one I mentioned. Then inside the FPGA, there are units we are using. So before, do you remember, I told you everything is transistors, right? And those are the ASIC uh, design. So if anybody is using cadence or anybody using synopsis, they will write the Verilog, they will use the cadence, deploy it on the layout transistor. But for us, the Verilog would be converted into a bunch of lookup tables, flip-flops, and VRAMs, and so on. What is lookup table? Consider like a big multiplexer. There is lookup table, two input, one output. There is a lookup table, three input, one output there is lookup table four input one output there is lookup table five input one output or five input two outputs and there is a lookup table six input one output or two outputs. those are the most famous lookup tables the current technology has on fpga then the second the no the second one for you the fourth uh, informative column in front of you sharing on how many flip-flops we have on the chip can you see it my cursor on it everybody can see it hello uh professor so the 6300 for uh, sorry 63400 is that how many elements are inside the lookup table, table. How many tables yes how many tables how many lookup table it's called lookup table l-u-t look 
up table. Let me write and it. Each right. lookup table, is there a limit for how many? Uh... On the chip. So the chip, it ha this chip, have you noticed? All of them, all of the, all of the chips part in front of you have the same numbers. Do you agree? Yes. But you know, our is minus one. You know what is this minus one is? The speed. The speed. The speed of the chip, the speed of the transistor on the chip. Do we have the slowest one? And this is the one we have on the on the Nexus Four, A7, maybe something else. Okay. Anyway, so. Wait, uh, sorry, this, is, this is neg uh, the XC. It's not negative. It's not negative. It's hyphen hyphen one. The XC7A is that Nexus Four or Nexus Seven? This is Nexus uh, Nexus 4 DDR. There is a, the other Nexus A7 is the upgraded version of this, which is the same, almost the same, but more resources. Okay. Okay, and I believe the, um, the 2018 will not see it. So, you know, because Vivado has to be upgraded to the library they have, like they have a database, right? Database attached to software. So at that time it wasn't exist, right? That's something you need to think about, it's called compatibility. So when you work in the field of the hardware and software, you have to think about compatibility. Scalability and compatibility. How can you scale a design up? How can you squeeze it down? That's one of the things you need to learn. And the other one you need to learn also about the, how it's compatible to the software you are using. That's two concepts, you know, ABC for any computer scientist. Okay? Now, lookup table and flip-flops, are the combinational circuit and the sequential circuit, 2300. So lookup table completely used to build combinational circuits. But somebody can tell me, professor, is it possible to build flip-flops using lookup table? Yes. Okay? That's called primitives. And there is a way to do it that's not very long. That's actually native block language. Nobody even knew it, but I know how to do it. Anyway, then there is another column in front of you. It's called block RAMs. What is block RAMs? Are block of re, uh, random access memories. Those random access memory on the ASIC part of the fabric. So the LUT and flip-flops are uh, soft core switches. What does it mean? They're flexible. So you can get wire here, wire there, and connect them to each other. Wire here, wire there, you connect them to each other. It's like Lego. It's like, you know, the Blado, like, you know, Blago, whatever you guys, right? The Blado, yes. But uh, block RAMs are ASIC. That means they're really fast. They're in the fabric. Like, you know, Raspberry Pi, for instance, you know, Raspberry Pi, fabric, ASIC. So that's why it's faster. We just have 135, Peter. Uh, okay, Peter. Okay. So, Raspberry Pi, is it an FPGA or microcontroller? Fabric. Or what? It's a fabric yeah. ASIC. It's fabric ASIC. The technology used for building Raspberry Pi is a fabric ASIC. But what is this microprocessor? And the technology for using FPGA is, what's it called? ASIC also, but the FPGA functionality is another layer of design. So here's the story. Uh -huh. Here's the story. ASIC is the something we use for building a chip. Okay, no matter what. But now, if you put on that ASIC just a processor, that's a fixed thing, right? So you program it with any language like C, Python, whatever, right? Yeah. But now ASIC, if you put in the top of a bunch of switches and you will just connect these switches to build circuits, so that means you increase the abstraction layer. That means instead of making it completely solid, you added another layer to make it flexible. So basically FPGAs have an extra layer just to change the-, the stability, exactly. It gives you an element to build circuits. Okay. Okay, anyway, so the ultra RAM, this is not in the lower version of FPGA. So for instance, the ultra skip plus, I have a million of ultra RAM. Those are lookup table, but they are running really fast as block RAM. It's called ultra RAM. Then, how many of you took the digital signal processing or DSPs? How many of you heard about this? With Ken, uh, Dr. Ken. But can you say that again? Dr. Kang, you know Dr. Kang? You know he teaches DSPs. 
DSPs, people go ahead and buy like a Texas AI. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like Raspberry, but it's called DSP. So what is DSP? It's a chip designed for the floating point operations used for signal processing application. Again, DSPs, that mean is a chip targeting signal processing application. Why signal processing application? Because the data format we have, it's either integer format or floating or real number format. What is the difference between of them? Because most of us are computer engineer, right? So the data format we have, when you program, when you say integer, that mean one, two, three, four, that's called integer format. When you are looking for the data, which is a real number, that mean is number integer with fraction. Like you say 1.3, 1.8. If you have 1.8 times 1.7, then the multiplier you are using to multiply the numbers in integer is no longer valid. You have to use something else to within this number, it's called floating point. I'm gonna teach this in a 4300, but also learning this in a site is not a really bad thing. So floating points need a specific processor. On the FPGA, it's called DSP. It's a elements. You can use it to build multiplier, adder, subtractors, and so on. Why we need this, somebody can tell me. How many of you heard about filters? When you are listening to the radio, right? And you are uh, tuning it, changing the channels of the radio. What are you doing? You are picking a certain frequency band and eliminating the rest of the frequency bands. Yes, low, pa low pass, high pass, uh, by, uh, uh, band, uh, band pass, and also there is a ton of them, exactly, exactly. So what are those? Basically, you are eliminating in band bass, you are taking a certain uh, slide of the uh, frequency while the rest will be running away. That makes sense? So, you can build filters using your FPGA. I can build you a radio on FPGA if you want. FPGA can be anything. Like you buy the Lego set and you build the Star Wars ships. I can build you Star Wars ships using FPGA. It's no problem. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the GB tra uh, transceivers and all of those guys are not in our cheap chip because you know those guys are used for what? For the communication application. Like you know, if you let's say that you know one of you guys will be a brilliant in a way that to study 5G and 6G communication and during the PhD, and he would like to build a product or uh, design and how they were to do such a kind of transmitter and receiver. Then you will need all of those transceivers. Those transceivers are used for the heavy communication applications involving FPGA. Okay? Now, what is this PC, PCIE? PCIE is one of the serial communication protocols. We don't have it on the board. We have a kind of communication a chip on it which is basically the FT is communicating to the UART so you know you don't have an access to it then what is MMCM this is something which I would love you to know MMCM is one of the way of uh, amplifying your frequency so there is two things we need to learn one is called clock divider that means you have the maximum clock frequency and you're breaking up into small clock frequency, it depends on your design requirement. Make sense? But there is something that's called a clock amplification. What does it mean? My clock is 100 megahertz, but my design can run up to 500 megahertz. What should I do? Then I will use the MMCM or the uh, PLL, the phase lock, uh, uh, locked, um, uh, what's called phase loop locked um, circuit, which is a, a, a ASIC circuit on the board to amplify the maximum frequency coming from the crystal. Everybody know that the crystal on the chip, this chip we have is 100 megahertz. 
Are they clocks? Yeah, yeah, you're gonna get clock. So you have to source it with a clock and you will get another clock out of it. Anyway, now there are some operators that I need to tell you. So I'm gonna show you something really fancy, which is a monitor on the chip telling you the temperature on the chip while you are running application. Super cool, you love. Then here is some of the electronics, purely electronics for the people while they're building the PCB board. So imagine the minimum voltage, this chip by itself on this board, it can run into 0.95 volt. So that's actually part of something you need to learn. It's called low voltage, low power. Have, how many of you heard about this concept? It's called LVLP. Yeah. L, L, V, LP. Low voltage, low power. Yes, it is very important concept for these people gonna work in ASIC. Let me tell you something. I was working as a R&D, research and development in Atma, and we were designing chips. Like, you know, my team designing Atmega. How many of you heard about Atmega? So we designed Atmega in uh, Atmel while I was in uh, Norway. So, you know, at, you know Atmel was an uh, American-based company, but the design house was in Norway. And I lived in Norway for like years and years. I did my PhD in Norway. Okay. Anyway, the maximum frequency, in maximum voltage, that means you can go up to the maximum of the voltage, 1.05. See, we are talking about some itty bitty tiny things. You know, basically the little itty bitty tiny volt, uh, what's called the battery, will not be able to operate it. You have to fraction it somehow, right? Because it's like one and a half volt. One and a half volt can actually fry your chip. So you need a voltage regulators. Like, you know, you have a diode and liners, diodes and stuff like that. Anyway, so everybody know that, you know, what type of resources we have on the specific chip we have? Put it in your hand, lookup table, flip-flops, combination and sequential circuit, VRAMs, and we will use it in a specific applications. DSPs is more into signal processing or uh, ultra speed uh, computation units. Next. So give you here a resources, say it's an Arctic 7 family. The speed grade is minus one, and I told you. you, you know, sorry, you know what this package mean? This C, CSG, whatever. Basically, when we are building circuit and ASIC, you build something that's called DAI. So whatever lookup table flip-flops, you know, whatever you have, that's called DAI. But you know, when you put the DAI, the DAI is very fraction. So you have to cover it into this uh, ceramic or whatever, you know, black, did you see this black thing? That's called package. So the, bla the black thing that, you know, we have writing up on it here on the board, that's called package. And this package is called CSG324. Okay, Duke? Finish. So, started. One second. Okay. okay. Anyway, every single step I have done in front of you multiple times, I'm going to show you some trick now. So one second, I turn it off. Uh, so we're going to go into the XDC file. I don't remember anything. I don't. I don't like to remember anything. So I just go like this. I don't want. I don't want to waste my uh, storage element in my brain. So basically, I, if I want something, I just go and bring it. So here is a copy of it. Copy, and then I will turn it back. Everybody see the Vivado, right? Add source. We have three different. See, I keep repeating because you know after that you know I'm gonna start giving you really heavy lab assignments. So uh, constraint here. So add or create constraints. Then the one I want, whatever name you want. Normally I call it Nexus. Nexus for DDR. 
say okay finish it's gonna be blinked so you're gonna go here and you know open it completely empty copy and finish right that's basically what we have so now I want to build something so I can show you the logic analyzer let's start with any combinational circuit any combinational circuit you would like and everybody remember see I'm stressing on stuff now right what is the combinational circuit we used to have Yeah, what does search? I can show you. Look, I wrote what XDC of Nexus 4 DDR. Can you see it? Chat. So I just like this, you know. Let's say A7. You know, you can do it. And I just went into GitHub. There is another way. You can just go into DigiLint and you download the XDC file. I mean, there is an infinity way of uh, getting your target. Basically. Now, I'm just repeating again. So we have three different type of modeling. You agree? One is called what? Structure modeling. One is called what? Data flow structure. And the third one we have is called what? Behavior modeling. You remember that, right? Let's say that I want to build data flow modeling. Of what? Uh, anything. Whatever you want. Basically, let's say that, you know, at source, I'm going to make it multiplexer. Create design. Create and it's a very look and I'm gonna go ahead and say that you know is a multiplexer. I'm just giving an example I have done this before in front of you, but I will do it one more time for a different uh, Purpose so you say that you know it's gonna be what gonna be select and you already have here IO and Let's say I zero and then you know let's say here I one And let's say here, you know output Right, and this is an output. I didn't pick any of the signals, if you remember, because I wanted to do what? Single, single bit mux, right? Then if you guys remember, I said, you know, you have to put here wire, even the new generation of Vado accepted to say that the default is wire. But you know, that's my notation. So I do it like this, you know. Anyway, now I can just say assign uh, OB equal. I'm making it as data flow. So gonna be what? It's gonna be I zero ended with uh, select or with I one ended with select. And that's it, right? And just to keep repeating stuff, because end of the day, you know, the whole entire idea is concept. It's not just like, you know, language. I would just say, you know, multiplexer data bus. So that means I'm gonna make a data bus from the multiplexer, because multiplexer are used for defining data bus. So I will just go ahead and say here, uh, select data. And then I can come in here and say uh, uh, input A. And in this case, it's going to be a bus. But I didn't say what is the size of it. And then I say here end. And I say a bus also. And then, you know, output is going to also be uh, output. And it's going to be a bus. Then we are learning from whatever, you know, we have done before, right? I'm just keep repeating. So. I will just instantiate this gentleman, which is a multiplexer, right? So I will go here and just say, okay, I will do like that. Slow down a little bit. Okay, sure. So I'll go here. And there I will just say, why? Now I'm gonna instantiate, so it's gonna be multiplexer, and I wanted to call it a name, right? So what is the name I need for multiplexer? Let's, so, let's say, you know, um, element Sounds good? Then you know, I will just say here um, What was the name? That's an instantiation So I zero I 
Sounds good? If you remember from the last lecture, which I hope all of you will watch it soon or you know somebody watch it already, I like parameters, right? And we have two different type of parameters. Somebody remind me, what is parameters we have? Uh, prem and local prem? Exactly. So the local prem is basically used for fixed value when I instantiate in a higher level it will stuck as it is. In an early stage uh, version of Verilog, it was given syntax error, but now it will never overwrite. But for the parameter, the normal parameters, still you can overwrite, correct? So in that case, you know, we need here to define what, I'm sorry, it's gonna be a parameter. And we call it what size for instance? And equal 15. Okay, now I say here size. So, one of the thing, you know, Elvis, I need to ask your questions. You know, when I say size here, right? Input A and input B are data bus, right? So if they are data bus like this, you know, and I want it to be with the size of 15, what should I write? I should write size minus one to zero or size to zero? The size minus one. Exactly, so gonna be size minus one. Why size minus one? Because at the end of the day, zero to size minus one is a size. Right? And don't forget, it's this language is the case what sensitive, right? So you go in here. Okay. Now, I want this multiplexer to be with the size. So if you guys remember, one of the things that we learned, it's what? Somebody tell me. What we learned is basically using the parameters for wrapping it up. Do you agree? So that was generate, I believe. Uh, uh, one second, something will happen. So I'm not sure what happened in the screen. My internet is being. Uh, can you buy? Can you guys see it again? Yeah. So we need what? Uh, we need to generate on um, uh, a kind of a wrapper, right? So in that case, what should we do? Somebody remind me. So we need to define an element like a for loop, right? So in that case, we need how many elements? We need one element, right? It's one dimension. So we just say gen var, and let's call it uh, i, i. So I generated something that's called i, right? Then I'm gonna use it in a for loop, but that for loop, there are two different type of for loop. That's what I want you to know, and I'm gonna also stress it later. There is for loop targeting RTL. There is for loop targeting test branch. Again, there is for loop targeting RTL. There is for loop targeting test branch. The for loop targeting RTL, it's generating. The for loop targeting test branch, there is no generate, just a for loop. For begin end, that's it. So, but now, you know, I'm gonna say generate. And from there, I can end it up with what end generate as an word, one word. What is inside as a skeleton is gonna be what you see in front of you now in a moment. So here, you're gonna write for, and of course, you're gonna make it with begin and you make it with. 
there is an error, which is understandable because I didn't mention what is the parameter inside the for loop. So far so good? So now, the, as you remember in the C, the error disappeared. Do you agree? Why? Because you already set up the right syntax. And here you can say that, you know, uh, behave. So professor, how is it reading uh, I if, it, if I is defined as gumvar? Because genvar asked the compiler, this is compiler, so that's a different course, but you know, I don't think you guys take in compiler and stuff like that here in Calpoli, right? So compiler in general, you know, you have to talk to the compiler. Like, you know, we are like human talking to humans. So the compiler in, in the Hadoop description language, which is written inside uh, Vivado, you have to identify to him a pointer. And the pointer is an I. And, you know, since it's an RTL, so since it's a, a, a syntax or the language you speak to it, it's called genvar. So that means generate a variable. And that variable you give a name which is called i. Later on, you will call i inside the generate, inside the full loop uh, skeleton. I want just to stress something here. In the beginning of this writing, I used data flow uh, architecture or modeling. You agree? Where is the data flow I used? I used in the describing the multiplexer in front of you. But then later on, in the top hierarchy file, which is called max underscore data bus, I use behavior modeling. What is behavior modeling here? I use for loop. For loop is behavior modeling. Is it clear? Yes. So there is no problem to mix between models. So you can call something behavior with something um, uh, structure with something data flow and you can mill them down without any problem. Is it clear? So now, the skeleton is perfectly fine. It's just waiting for us to do what? To fill the multiplexer element. So in that case, before I do anything, have you noticed in, under the design sort that, you know, the max single bit got replicated? Right? Yes. It's multiplicated here. It's like four, 0 to 14. That means it's uh, 15 elements uh, coming out of the size, right? And if you noticed for the, uh, there is some uh, something in the, in the computer science is called regular expressions. How many of you heard about regular expressions? So regular expression is a set of rules have been designed for the software perspective in a way that you know you will be able to uh, multiplicate stuff with a different uh, automated names so if you notice we followed the rules of the instantiation by making the max named ex e -L -E -M, right but then the automatic this is a manual regular expression but the manual the automatic uh, regular expression came from the generate that's why we have this generate and generate so generate and generate give a number to the ELEM. So you notice? So it consider behave as an array and it give a, an index to the array. Have you noticed that? So behave zero, behave one, behave two. So what happened, the compiler considered that as what? As an array and starting it with an index, all of this because of the generate. So I'm giving you actually not just like hardware description now, I'm giving you also the beyond knowledge of software. So now this multiplexer is con uh, controlling data bus. How many selects should we have? My, my, uh, you know, I need to know how many switch, uh, how many select I should have from your point of view. Somebody give me an idea. Huh? For the 15 uh, outputs. Do you think we need 15 uh, select? 
No, no, I'm asking like, are you talking about the 15 muxes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many select I should have? Only one. One. Why? It is correct, but oh, it's one. Because end of the day, you know, you need to select between 15 here and 15 there. And the output will be 50. So you just need one select. Right? Yeah. So that select, it should be what? It should be tied to the select there. Right? Now, I0, it should be INB underscore A with indexed and in, um, sorry, B with another index and OB with another index. Do you agree? And that index will be what? I. I don't know why it doesn't like this one. So. Huh? What do you mean by OP? Let us say data. It's supposed to be brackets, right? Not parentheses. Uh, by the way, the, the compiler written wrong. So uh, you have to be sure that, you know, everything is... They have a lot of bugs, you know? I found a ton of bugs in, the, in their compiler. And there is a way to hack it. I, I can teach you about this but later. What is the error now? Huh? Oh yeah, there's an extra packet. Yes. Have you noticed something? On the, on, the, on the left side under the design source, any errors happen simultaneously, it will be reflected on the syntax source error. You agree? Yes, I've seen that If I made a mistake here, look. What happened in the design source? It go into di yeah, directly once you save. It's a syntax error file immediately. Yeah. So, you know, if I go ahead and fix it like this and use control S for saving, it Once it's updated, updated, it and then, you know, automatically it will say cleared up. That makes sense? While you are doing this process, you have to look in the bottom here to the TC console messages, which is giving you and a reflect of errors from the, uh, from the, um, what's called, from the compiler and the log here and the reports. Here is the reports we are talking about. I'm gonna show it to you. And also there is a very nice useful bar here showing you everything about the timing and the resources used. So have you noticed something? Look, do you see my cursor? Everybody see my cursor? Yes. So look, there is synthes synthesis and with constraints. And there is here a WNS, which is the worst negative slack. I'm gonna teach you soon, maybe next uh, on Monday, I will teach you something about timing. So there is worst negative slack, there is total negative slack, there is worst hold slack, and there is total hold slack, there is a total pulse with slack, that's for the, uh, if you have a flip-flop, and there is total power on chip. So you deploy something on the chip, how much power it's used. It will give you an estimator, estimation, and what is the routes failed inside the FPGA while you are doing the process? And then you already have how many lookup tables, how many flip-flop, how many VRAMs, how many URAM, and we don't have, and how many DSP, and start time of the synthesis elapsed is gonna be the last time that before the synthesis will be over. Synthesis is the first stage of con converting your uh, hardware description language Verilog into prime circuit. But then later on this circuit, it has to be completely solidly optimized. When is the optimization happen? You will go and implement, which is the implementation here. Then sometime numbers between the synthesis and implementation will be different. Which one is more accurate implementation? 
because this is the one finally you will go ahead and you will map on the generate bit stream on the FPGA. Is it clear? Yes. Super. Anyway, now, yes, we have the multiplexers and you know how to write the test bench. Do you agree? Or should I write the test bench? Can you write it, please? Okay, how many of you are in favor of me writing the test bench? Okay, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, add source and add or create simulation resources. Next, create, and I will call it multiplexer data bus and TB. Okay, okay, and I say finish. Everybody agreed that, you know, in the, the parentheses on the test bench, it should be empty. That's the test bench. It's just an environment so we can push data into the input and drag the output onto the waveform to see what is going on. And of course, it would be super awesome to use logic analyzers when we are mapping on a real FPGA. So let's see what will happen. So we're gonna go into the simulation here. We found out there is something called max data bus underscore TB we just uh, generated. So what we need to do, because you know my memory is not really great, so I will take a copy like this and I will do it here and I will just stand in the button here and I will go ahead and just copy it there. In a moment, it will be errors, which is perfectly fine. I like errors. So you will go here and say max data bus and we should give it a name. So we say it's a max TB. It's a test bench of the max. And we'll just go ahead and do like that. What we should have is basically the ports of the in and out. So that's called select underscore data. That's called uh, in a, that's called in b, that's called OB data. So far so good? So I don't think we need the, the, the thing anymore. But what we need now, we need to parameterize. So we need here to say size, and we put something in the middle here, let's say 14, just an example. If I like to have a clean thing, I can just go ahead and do like that. I can make another prompter for this bench, right? Which is called uh, parameter, and I will call it size TB equal um, 32. Sounds good? Then I can go ahead and say size, and instead of making number like this, I can just pick size TB there. Okay, look. So what I did in front of you now, I instantiated the block inside the test bench, and I made the parameters for the test bench so it would be easy for me and clean to remember once every time that I would like to change values in it. That makes sense? Now we need to define the ports. And one of you guys corrected me, which I appreciated about, you know, input should be what registers and the output should be what. Do you agree? So input, it's select TB. Input is also, it should be size underscore TB minus one to zero. And they're gonna be the uh, uh, in, in TBA and in TB. Have you noticed something? I, I put it both of them in one line. Somebody tell me why. But why I didn't put them with the select underscore TB? 
Is there because any explanation? They have their own unique size. Exactly. Because you know the MTBA and MBTB, both of them have the both of them they have the same size, uh, which is the size underscore TB minus one to zero. Which is that case when you would put the number numerical there, that means 32 bit both of them. While select underscore TB is a single wire or a single bit. Right? I would recommend the output to be by itself because the output is just like for observation. So it's gonna be wire, so I need to push data in it. So it's gonna be here size TB minus one to zero still, and that's I'm gonna call OB TB. So work. Now it's just like you know, filling the wires like you in the breadboard. Now with the breadboard that's in front of you, we connected the power and everything is fine. So no, we have to connect the power. I will tell you how can I connect the power. So it's gonna be here what select TB I N B T B A I N B T B D and uh, O B TV. So far so good. We connected everything. So we need to have what power supply to push inputs, right? Everybody agree? That will be using procedure block. How many procedure block from the, the presentation the slides uh, I shared with you we have? We have two. Everybody agree? Somebody tell me the first one is what? Is it initial? Initial, correct. The second one is always block. And we're gonna cover both of them for this bench and RTL uh, in a moment. So for this bench, I like initial block. Why initial block is important? Because initial block started from the T equals zero up to the point of time that you need and it will not repeat back. Okay, unless you try a trick, which is always, then it will repeat back. So it's gonna be here initial. That means one shot, Test. Begin. End. You can name it if you would like to have a multiple initial block inside your circuit. There is no shame. So you can just go ahead and say that you know TB attempt one. So I give it a name now to the compiler, and it will be easy for me to follow while I'm writing here the information about my test. So there, first of all. I would like to make everything serious, right? So I will connect everything into the ground for a certain moment. So I will connect the select TB to the ground and this is single bit. And we already covered this before, right? We said we can connect it no matter how it looks like. You can make it with bits, you can make it represented in decimal, you can represent it in the binary, you can represent it into hexadecimals and octals and whatever systems you have. I can represent the others like, you know, um, N, T B A to B in that case it's a size T B right I can just make it like that uh, D fifteen there I made a mistake when you make it in like a comma like this D that means I open it into thirty two bit so this fifteen bit. This 15 as a value would be represented in 32, but, but in reality, we have just 32. You guys agree? So when we leave it open like that, it has a range of 32 bits automatically? It's in the, yes, in the slides uh, I, I shared with you last time. Yes. It would be considered like a single, a single representation. It's called 32 bit. So like integer, basically. So in that case, we need to define something. I'm not sure this version will allow me to do this trick or not. It didn't allow me. It said it, I wanted to show you a trick because I was trying to build a quantum FPGA. That's some research I do, but it didn't work. Anyway, so in that case, we can just say 32. I know there is another trick. I will find it and I'll give it to you next time. So we can make everything configurable. So have you noticed what I did here? I said, you know, this is 15 as a decimal represented in 32 bit. Do you agree? Then NBTVB, B, I can, uh, Scheiser, it's a case, case sensitive language. So I can say 32H, 
So in that case, I'm gonna write it in hexa, right? 32, so that means you already have um, 32 divided by four, eight, right? So eight characters, so it has to be uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you know you can just write A, <laughs> right? So that mean also NB it has uh, 15, but in that case I don't want it. So I'm gonna write zero here, I'm gonna write zero here. So what I'm expecting at T is equal zero, that you know, select TB is equal zero. Uh, the data bus 32-bit uh, A, it will be zero. And data bus 32-bit uh, B will be zero. Uh, professor, I think I think it might have been the, the line cut off, so I, I didn't get the whole thing. So what is the one before the B and what's the zero after the B? Oh, I can say that's not a problem. So again, so that, that before the B is the size of the bits inside the wire itself. So select TB is one, one, one wire, right? Yeah. So in that case, it's a one. And in a binary, I would like to represent zero. Oh, so it's it's only one wire, and you want it to be zero. Exactly. Always. I can, and also, I can do it like this. Would be the same thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a one bit. It's a one bit, and I'm presenting as a zero decimal. It's still zero. So also in, input um, input b. Sorry, input yes. b underscore a. Um, Oh, oh, that's input test bench. So test bench A, so that's 32 wires and they're all zeros? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and why did we put eight zeros next to the H? I'm just trying to make a different representation. That's it. I'm telling also, you. Basically, they're all the same thing. Here, it can, it can be represented by Okay, now when I made, uh, one of you asked me about this uh, hash pound and you know, you said, oh, you're using also for instantiation, right? So this hash pound here in front of you with number is giving a delay, it's giving me a delay. So what it says here, it says that, you know, from zero time up to 10 nanoseconds, keep all of this information zeros. That makes sense? Now, in the nanosecond 11, something else will happen, which say enable uh, a TA for an instance is equal 32 uh, D4. So what I'm saying there, in the moment of the 11, up to, up to another 10 more seconds, uh, 10 nanoseconds, up in 20 seconds, what will happen? The enable TAB that will be equal four, but says select is equal zero and B is equal zero. So what is the output we are expecting to be as an OP? It will be four. That makes sense? Yes. Then you can maybe go and say, uh, and after 10 nanoseconds, you know, make the TB equal uh, one, for instance, right? So in that case, I'm asking to pick up the second option, which is zero at the time, right? Then- uh, So Professor, just a question. Why do we put uh, less than or equal to when we just want it to be equal? Uh, blocking, non-blocking. Do you remember when I was talking about blocking, non-blocking? Might have uh, might have been lost with all the information. Yeah, block, you know you need to go check the next uh, the older version. It's just basically the if it runs parallel or sequentially, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So because we want it to run sequentially, we have it less than or equal to. Sorry, uh, parallel. We. Uh, we have I mean, it does, it, it, in the test bench, it doesn't matter. You can just actually you know you can remove this. I will show you something. I'm gonna show you even something more fun, you know? 
I didn't use any representation. I'll just say equal four. Uh -huh. See, because this bench at the end of the day, it's a kind of like software. It's like it a simulation, but we, when we put it on the board, it has to be it has to be, you have to be following rules. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anyway, now I can say after uh, uh, maybe after 100 nanoseconds, later on I will replicate, I will remove these numbers and I will make it for you also parameters. Okay? That's step by step. After this, I'm saying finish. That means the waveform will stop. Sounds good? So I can run simulation now and see what would happen. And you see the zoom fit? So look, look with me. The, the, the waveform is zero nanosecond, 10 nanosecond, right? Can you look? Zero nanosecond. Uh, zero nanosecond. Here is 10 nanosecond, right? 20 nanosecond and up, right? Look, zero nanosecond, everything started to zero. So select it was zero. The uh, NBTBA was zero, and NBTB was zero, and OTB was zero, and of course, you know, the, that was a side, right? One of the things you need to learn also, if you would like to change the valuable representation. So let's say I don't want to see it as a hexa. Here's the representing as a hexa. You can just click right like that, radix, and I say uh, hexa. Uh, I unsigned this one. You know what does unsigned decimal mean, right? You remember the sign unsigned? You can just go ahead and say radix unsigned decimal. Radix unsigned decimal. Radix unsigned decimal. So let's say that you know the bus is 32 bits. Uh, the OBT will be equal zero from zero to 10 nanoseconds. But when later on I change it, the the, the the input a to be four at that moment exactly the output term to be four because the select was equal zero and then in the moment of 20 nanoseconds i converted the select to be one so automatically it jumped back to zero and i stayed as i asked it for 100 nanoseconds and then i stopped there so if you notice from the moment of 20 nanoseconds at 100 so 120 and at that moment you stop is it clear? Mario? Oh yeah. I was actually wondering if we could uh, see your, your elaborate design as well, for just to see like the modules connecting and everything. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do it now because I'm gonna put logic analyzer. Oh, okay. So don't worry. So everybody now understand what I did in this bench. It should be clear, right? We already repeated multiple times. So now, also, if you would like to dig and see some internal stuff, there is no shame. You know, you can just go see here. So for this and here, all of the names, look, like inside the board, like a JTAG and some other stuff. But there, here is the INBA, INBB before we call it inside the this bench. Do you remember? But inside the this bench, when I stopped here, everything in, in, turned into be in, in B, T, B underscore a and b t b underscore b and so on right so log names change right stop in a different level can you see it yeah so if it's clear write yes If there is any problem, you can say, uh, please uh, repeat something. I will repeat. Kind of. So what is the problem, uh, Kingston? Uh, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. It's not that I have a question. I just, I'm just confused, that's all. Okay. So what is the best thing that you need to do is to practice. 
practicing is very important. This is a language. You know, it's very important to practice stuff like that. Anybody else has also some doubting or need help or something to be clarified? So are most of our assignments, uh, they're going to be structural based or more behavioral? It can be any of them. So because okay. you, you know rules of the structure modeling and, uh, and the data flow modeling and the behavior model, right? I see. And of course, you know, over time, I keep adding more syntax to you, right? I've done, but no questions for now. So what is the doubt, Elvis? Maybe you can share it with me and I will try to help. Oh, Maybe like oh. what was the purpose of loading constraint if we didn't use the, the GitHub file thing we grabbed earlier? What happened? The constraint file that we grabbed earlier from GitHub, what was yes. the point of taking that if we didn't use it? Or is it just oh, like... We're going to use it now. They're going to okay. be deploying on the chip. Mm. Any other questions? I'm here for helping you guys. So, you know, there is no problem. There is no shame. I'm a little bit confused on the, uh, the size, how you could go from 16 to 32. That's all that's confusing me right now. It's confusing yeah. because, you know, this is the trick of the parameters with an instantiation. That's something unique in the hardware description language. So pretty much, you know, if you want to fully understand the trick inside the compiler, I can tell you. But you know, that would be too much complicated. But in general, take it as it is, as a like, you know, a real fact that one plus one is equal to. If you call parameters, what will happen, it will map. It's something inside the compiler. It's automatically will repeat the blocks as many as you want. Okay, so just do it for me. Yes. Okay, that answers it, thanks. I'm gonna do something now because I need also to fit into the board, right? I said size 15. How many LED I have on the board? I have 16 LED and I have 16 switches. We are limited of number of representation I, and that will be one of the lab assignments I'm gonna give it to you soon. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave it for you because still part of it, it has to be part of your uh, creativity. But for me to make it easy so I can show you in, the, in general how can I use logic analyzer, I will make the 15th. Now I'm in RTL, if you notice. I'm not in the test bench anymore. So I'm talking about RTL. So 15, this one, it will be um, uh, and instead of this, I need 4-4, four, four, right? So maybe I can make it 4-4. Four, four. So you are talking about 4. Why? Uh, we need four switches for A, four switches for B, and then four LED for representing the output, and one switch for the select. Everybody agree about this? Yeah. Why? Because switches are devices used for what? Huh? Used for what? Used for the Input, exactly. The output device is representation. So all your eyes can see is LED, seven segment display and stuff like that, right? We haven't taken the seven segment display yet. I'm gonna show it to you maybe in the next week as well. So now it's four four. The part that you know King Sun was talking about, why we need the XDC. You guys are right. So I need to map those into the XDC. So I will take select data. And I have here everything sectioned inside the XDC. So I have 16 switches here, right? So I need switch zero, I need switch one, two, three. Those four I'm gonna use for what? For representing the first input port. Then I will try to keep one switch I don't use at all, and that will be just a section. So I can be able to distinguish differences between of them. Then switch five, six, seven, eight, I will use for representing the input underscore B. Okay, what else I need? Maybe I can make the last switch 16 to be representing the select. Do you guys agree? Yes. Okay, so now 
those are named SW, SW, but in reality, data bus here is called INBA. So I have to take INBA like this, and I altered any switch of the first partition. So B like this. So what I did now, I hooked control of the pin IO I mentioned in the beginning of this um, lecture to the design. And I need to do the same thing for the NBA. So NB, the B. So they're going to be B, 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 B. But then I just have four, so gonna be zero, one, two, three. Do you guys have any questions so far? Wait, so are you for the switches? Huh? The the switches? What happened? Yeah, 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 because you know you have to be aligned with the name in the module you would like to what to communicate with. SW is not is not existing my module. Oh, I see, I see. You got my point? There yeah. is one thing is missing, if you guys noticed, that you know, still this one is called switch 15. So I have to remove switch 15 and wrap alter with select underscore date. Oh, so the order doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, but you have to remember the switches, right? Yeah. So what is this I would tell you? Do you remember SW0? That is the SW0, the first one. Can you see? Ah, this one. This is W0, this is W1, this is W2, S3, up to 15. Here is LAD0, LAD15. How I would know it? If you have the border in front of you, do you have the board in front of you? Everybody have the board in front of him? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go in the board and look into the switch uh, from the right. You will find in the top of uh, it is called J15, right? Yeah, J15. Look at this. What is this pin is called? J15. Exactly. Uh, go into the last one. It's called V10. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Look at there. What is this? V10. So you will be aligning your head that you know this is the, the first one, this is the last one. The last one is going to be the select. And the first four, it will be representing A. And then you will leave one switch. And then the, first, the four consecutively will be representing B. Sounds good? Additionally, Professor, the XDC file only looks at the inputs and outputs on the top module, correct? Exactly. It doesn't look at anything else. No, no, it doesn't look into the bottom of the hierarchy. It looks to the top of the hierarchy. It's simply the top module, yeah. Wait, okay. but there is also something you can do inside the hierarchy of the XDC. I will show it to you in a moment. There is a way that you can write constraints for timing. And there is another way also to write, um, stay with me, uh, write uh, the ILA, the logic analyzer. I will show it to you, just take it easy on it and it will, the XDC is written in something, it's a language, it's called TCL, Tickle Script. TCL Script. Before Vivado, they have something, it's called UCF, not XDC, okay? Now, we need the device to represent the output. Do you agree? Here's the device to represent the output, LED. So how many LED we need? Four, right? One, two, three, four. But, oh, that output device is not called LED. It's called what? OB data, right? So I take OB data and I go there and altered every LED by OB data. So, is there anything else missing 
So we can start the synthesis from your point of view. Mario? I don't think so. I don't think so either. You're right. So in that case, I can literally close the simulation, discard. And I go into the run synthesis. So I'm running synthesis. Have you noticed there is, a, do you see my, uh, my the arrow? It is actually pointing to a greenish circle going like this, right? So if I stop here in front of you in the design thing, it says the starting time it was of this process is in September 9th at one o'clock one. PM and the elapsed time or the elapsed time is going to be 14 for now until it will finish. So it's reporting to you what is going on, right? It say now 33 seconds. So that means it's have been working for 33 seconds. And it's still, see, oh yeah, it finished, I believe. See, it finished in the 51 second, right? Now, I can continue to the rest of the design. There is no problem, nothing will hurt me until I deploy it on the chip. But I would like also, while the chip is doing this, some uh, screen or monitor would come out to show me internally what's going on. Do you agree? That's the logic analysis. So in that case, I can just stop like this. I say, I don't want it. And I go into the open synthesis design. Before I go into the open synthesis design, have you noticed the synthesis result? Can you show months super quick again here? Brian, can you see it? Okay, now, have you noticed, as I told you, how many lookup table we use for 16 uh, multiplexes? Have you noticed? Four, just for a lookup table. No uh, flip flop, no VRAM, nothing, right? Okay, now I'm gonna go and open synthesis design. Here's the circuit. Do you see it? So draw the circuit for you. How many lookup table? One, two, three, four. Each one is taken four. And you're getting the four here output here. Four, 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 four. One, 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 four output. Now, I want to set up the logic analyzer. So can you guys see my cursor? There's something that's called set up the bug and you already have the bug, <laughs> right? Can you see it? So you stop here on the set of the one. And you next. And you open something in front of you, which is basically a rig X, a regular expression. So you stop here and say, find net to add and leave the star because this is the part of the rig X. So you're gonna write all of the input output signals you would like to what to monitor. So in that case, I want what in was MBA, right? I found it. See? So the compiler added to it something that's called IBUF. You know what does IBUF mean? Input buffer, which is correct. This was input. So it was M underscore A underscore M buffer, and it has four. Look at four. What does four mean? It has four what? Wires. Can you see it? And I say, okay. So I add it. It's completely data. And there is no clock in it. Then you go here and say, you know, uh, end. Okay. 
and the spell that also fall. There is no clock domain because we are not using clock here, right? We are just like in a combination of circuits. Don't need clock domain. Anyway, then you know what was the other one? Squash select, right? Data ID. And that was one bit here. Then what was the output is called? OB data. See now it's called OB buff, that means output buffers, and it also is called it. So far, do you guys have any question? Hello? Not right now. Okay. So you already have data. Is it triggered or data? It's data. You know what does trigger mean? That means there is a clock you are monitoring. So it's gonna be here data. Data. Guess what it says? It says there is no clock domain. You know why the why clock domain is important? Somebody tell me why clock domain is important. The clock domain? Mm. Because logic analyzer need a clock. It's that's oscillator, right? To monitor. Do you guys agree? Definitely. So in that case, I can trick it. <laughs> How can I trick it? Somebody tell me. I can go into the MUX database and I design input and I say clock. input and I say reset and those are useless for me it's just like you know I'm making them just like you know to pass some power you know since you already have a clock I'm gonna teach you now something which is sequential circuit okay we're gonna use the second procedure block which is called what always block it's called what always block if you write always like this That means you are targeting RTL. If you write it like this, you are using it for the simulation. So forget about this now, and just let's go into the always block here. This is basically what flip-flop for testing. Then, the flip-flop in general, you guys remember that how many flip-flop we have in the 2300? How many of them we have? Four types? Yes, can you please uh, name them? Tell me some. Uh, JK D and T. Okay. Oh, JK. Yes. There's more. There's, There's one, one more. more. S? No, no, no. There was one more. S? What S? No. Mario. Uh, I just had the JK one. I know there's others. <laughs> oh, you guys forgot to edit CR. Oh my God. Okay. SR. <laughs> SR, flip flop. JK, flip flop. D flip flop, T flip flop. And SR flip flop came from the latch, SR latch. Do you remember? Mm. Do you remember the flip flop work based on what? The edges of the clock. How many of you agree about that? Yeah. Okay, so in that case, we need the positive or negative edge of the clock, right? A rising edge or the falling edge. The rising edge is called positive edge. So we call it here pause edge and pass edge of what of clock did you see that or i can i want to see the output of this uh, uh flip-flop on the nig edge nig edge of the clock so normally in the sequential circuit you have positive edge of the clock negative edge of the clock Positive edge of the clock when you are going from the no charge to the highs of the charge. 
that's called positive weight. That means you are charging. The, and when you are losing the charge, that means you are going down. That's called negative weight or falling. Sounds good? Normally, I use positive edge. Normal designs use positive edge or negative edge. I have a US patent that approved in uh, two months ago. I used both of them, positive edge and negative edge of the clock. And that speeded up the hell of that, the chip. The chip got fried. Anyway. So if we needed to use that, can we use it for free? The patent, you have <laughs> to pay money. It's uh, for the Department of Defense. So, you know, you go talk to them, <laughs> not to me. <laughs> anyway, so now you can just go ahead now. So always block. Normally you already have, you list here the signals or the inputs and out, the inputs will be changed and based on the change of this input, whatever inside this block will be updated again. So every single positive edge of the clock inside this always block, what will happen the, the dynamically the, the whatever we're gonna be written inside will be updated or will be checked whether that's updated or not. Example. So let's give another input and call it here output and drag this time because you know always block it's flip-flop because it's positive edge. If you are talking about data, you're storing it in the clock, that means you know you need reg register. You agree? So in that case, I will call it test. I just need it for testing. So I can just go ahead and say, you know, if, so I'm teaching you now behavior. Do you agree? It's a behavior model. If, reset, people write it like this. What does it mean? Somebody can tell me. It means that if reset ever goes, oh. <laughs> but yeah, if it goes high, if the reset yeah. is equal high, do it. One of you guys asked me in the slide that I shared with you before about this double, double equal and triple equal. Do you remember? You guys don't remember. So I'm saying, means a double equal. So if equal, equal, because you're th you thinking about logical perspective, if equal one, this is exactly like, you know, if you, I'm going to make it like this. If you, if you do like this, if you do like this, this is completely equal to this. Then you're going to make begin and end. Normally in begin and end, if you're just controlling one line after the if statement, you don't need begin and end. But if you have more than that, you make begin and end. Normally I put begin and end because sometimes I make mistakes, so I make it like a you know, structure. So begin and end. If the reset happened, that means the output of the flip flop will be equal what zero. Do you agree? So test equal. Ha! Huh. Somebody will tell me what is this? Do you remember the blocking and blocking? Yes. This is important in sequential. So you have to do it with this way. Why? Because if you make everything with equal, that means blocked happen. So in that case, all of them happen at the same time. So you are confusing the compiler and you are killing the chances of them to get the right data at the same time. So you have to relax the clock at the time. Okay, so this is what, this is the non-blocking, right? So that means test is equal zero if there is it happen. Then, that's it? No, I need another function, it's called else. Begin, end. So, if what? If not reset happening, that mean this, this flip-flop is reading, right? So it's reading what? It's making the test, is equal select data. That's it, just like making something. So what we did now inside this example, we learned a lot of stuff today, right? What we learned, we learned that always block is used for sequential circuit. We learned that positive edge of the clock, it's one of the events we can use for the sequential circuit. 
we learned that you know if we are looking to the reset under the edge of the clock, that means we are in synchronized circuit. It's called synchronized reset. So this called sync reset. What does it mean, sync reset? That's also from the 2300, by the way. To make the reset clock uh, synchronous? Exactly. So, sorry. Uh, so the reset is synchronous. That means, you know, if the reset is high, but the positive edge of the clock didn't happen, reset will never happen. Reset will only happen when the positive edge of the clock is happening and the reset is equal one. So you are putting too much constraint here. That's called synchronized reset. But if you are resetting, no matter what is the clock situation is, that's called asynchronized reset. That makes sense? If it's not clear, tell me guys. So the, syn the synchronizing one is like, it's, it's happening together with the clock? Exactly. And then asynchronous is, it's resetting regardless of where the clock is. Exactly, exactly. That's called asynchronized, yes. Normally people use the synchronized for the high performance application. Uh, and using the asynchronized for the low power application, like an IoT. How many of you heard about IoT? Is IoT, IoT? Yes. Is, is that the Internet of Things? And, uh, Internet of Things. Like, you uh, know, the watch here I have in my hand is IoT, right? The sensors, you know, we are using to track your car is IoT. Okay. Anyway. So somebody else will tell me, this circuit is representing what? A clock. Is representing the flip-flop. Isn't that the clock? This circuit is representing the flip-flop. One of the questions are really famous in the book and any resources, and I can bring it in exam. I can write a piece of code, and then I will, can tell you that, hey guys, you know, if you synthesize this code, what the circuit will be? That's famous question I bring. So in that case, this circuit, it's basically telling you uh, in the positive edge of the clock, there is no reset happening, the input equal the output. That's the flip flop. Go back to the source if you want. You will look to the excitation table, the characteristic table, and the truth table of the um, of the D flip flop. Sometimes people call the characteristic table a stick table, which is fine. Okay. Okay. I added extra guy here. It's called task, so I need to pass it to the XDC. And in that case, you know that's actually what. It's uh, output, so it can be LED, right? So what about if we go into the XTC file? Since the select is in the last switch, maybe we can make it last LED, right? Now I can run sentence again, because you know, I have to update the, the design. It says that now I'm running it in 119, which is correct. And every couple of milliseconds, it will start updating the elapsed uh, time. While you know this guy is moving, and you can see it also there under the name here, it's uh, rounding. Actually, Professor, if what does it mean? I got the synthesis critical warning that the multiple driven net on pin uh, OP, or for you, it's OP data. Uh, oh, that's actually mean that you are connected to one pin twice. To one pin twice, OK. Anyway, now we have the thing. Have you noticed something? Look at the table now. It's a four lookup table and what? 
one flip-flop, which is correct. We build flip-flop, right? Do you guys agree? Now I'm gonna go in the setup debug and we'll do the trick again. So next setup and we'll just say input. Oh yeah, we forgot. <laughs> we have to define the clock. Somebody didn't tell me that. So we have to have a clock. We said there is a clock and reset. Did we make the clock and reset? So the reset there, it should be a button, right? So we have five buttons, I believe, right? Can you guys see on your board? We have five buttons here. Those five, can you see them? So maybe we can take the, the BTNC. B, T, and C, where is, the, where is this? Buttons, B, T, and C. This one, we can make it what? Reset. Then we have to define also the clock because we sit in the design here, what clock? So what is the clock? It's basically the first two lines in front of you here, clock signals. So the inside the FBGA, there is internal crystal, which is running up to 100 megahertz. There is an opportunity which is for using the PLN and stuff like that, and I'm gonna show it to you in, after we finish this task. So in that case, I will just go ahead and see, remove the, the two lines here, and the clock is not called clock 100 megahertz, it's called in our file just clock. Let me just make it like that. That makes sense? With any background, it's a clock to our case, to our case. So you know now we have the clock, we have the inputs of the of the multiplexers, we have the selector of the multiplexer, we have the output of the multiplexers, we have just a test start to pass some clock so you know logic analyzer can work, and we have a reset for it, just like you know for resetting. You know what I mean? Now we're gonna run again synthesis. Every change that you make an RTL, you have to rerun the synthesis again. So now it's telling you which change the time. Okay, still one four, and then now I'm gonna go say open since the design, open it. Here is the circuit, here is the multiplexer in the top with the blue thing, and uh, here is a flip flop for the getting the test output here. And of course, you know, you see the test and OBD data. And you see these names because you already connected them to the XDC. Make sense? Set up the bug. Let's hope that it's gonna work this time. And we can just go ahead and say, I'm looking for clock. And here is the clock. There is one is called general buffer. There is one internal buffer. So I'm gonna take the internal. And this is, we are looking for trigger. We are not looking for data uh, into the clock. While we are looking for the input, uh, A, and I'm gonna be data. Uh, let's say something here. Uh, okay, now it's working with clock. Do you see that? So I tied it with clock, the error disappeared. Then I say input. 
B and by the way, I made a mistake and I'm gonna keep it as a mistake. Then you know we will figure it together why it's a mistake and we'll fix it together also. Okay. So the data, both those guys are data. Data, both those guys are data, and then you know select. Data. So we have select input output. I need output, right? So it's gonna be OB data. Oops. One second. So we send now is data, right? OB data, input, input, block, select. Anything else we need to add from your point of view? We can add test, it's not a problem. Test, and here's the test, and it's output buffers, and also that's gonna be data. Then, the logic analyzers that we have on the FPGA is really a little bit weird and tricky. Why? It's actually take sample of data, present it, and take another sample, present it, take another sample and present it and flash it like this in front of you. So say it's sample of data depths, how much samples of data we have, 1024, you have a lot of them, but that will take more resources on the chip. So it's up to you, remember on what the debug is for. Oh, okay, the debug is logic analyzer. I'm building logic analyzer in front of you to analyze the circuit while it's running live. So I'm taking all the input and output on it. Okay, stay a second with me. So now I'm saying, let's say for now then, let's say four stages or three stages, okay? And they capture with advanced trigger. Okay, finished. I'm gonna show you something for the one who asked me about the XDC and writing on it. So now you know it's creating the debug, right? It's created. Super cool. But then you know I can just run what and can run again. Did you see what happened? It say I, I will add something to the XDC. So I'm running now implementation, so it's gonna run again synthesis and initial design. Look what will happen. So I'm running implementation now. So we are running the second step here, which is the run implementation. Take some time. You guys tried to play with uh, Vivado before? Does it take the same time as I, it takes with me? Professor, I wanna know when your birthday is so I can get you an SSD instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
I cannot have SSD in this laptop. It's very bad. Um, and next time I will run the whole thing on the, my Linux machine. It's faster. Actually. Wait, wait. You can't put an SSD on on the laptop. Yeah, yeah. this one is uh, is not supporting that. I will try to run it on Linux. I hate Windows. Windows takes forever. Linux better. And all the companies work with Linux, by the way. Is it like more secure or what? More relevant. Windows have a lot of problems. Plus it's easy for communicating with the IU uh, driver on uh, Linux, then you know Windows. What about external XSD? Yeah, still it's from the computer architecture perspective, when you have an external, that means you're gonna be connected by the bandwidth of the USB. Then, you know, in that case, you know, you're gonna be very, very slow. Because the chapter five in the memory hierarchy in the computer architecture, when you attend this course, you will fully understand this trick. While it's running, I want to see what happened to the XDC file. I'm gonna close it and then reopen it. Look what happened. Did you see it? So there is something being created inside the XDC. Can you see it? That's also thicker language. You can write it by your hand, it's not a problem. But of course, you know, it's automated by the way I use the setup debug. So this bunch of line of code helped me to call the logic analyzer, which you guys will see in a moment. And here's the recipe. If there wasn't a logic analyzer on, on the board, yeah, it's yeah. gonna be on the gonna be not on the board. It's gonna be on the board, yes, but on the screen it will pop out and it will show you values. Oh. Of the signals while you are while your life is changing the input. Oh, I see. So you understand my point? Instead of going in oscilloscope in the lab, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's basically what I'm 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 talking about. You can also use it for other applications if you want. You know, you can pass signals through the PMO. Okay. It's taking forever. Oh my gosh. Professor, possibly yes. after this class, is it possible to get the .v files on GitHub for everything you've done? Or or rather, how long does it take for the recording to go up? The recording will be immediately. Once I finish, you know, I'm, oh, gonna, put okay. in, I'm gonna put it immediately to the Bloodboard. Or All right, then. the .v files, because like that allows us to follow up faster. What happened? If you can upload these files, the, the Vivado files, to Blackboard so that we can download them and like play around with it. But you can build a replica. I prefer actually to write by your hand. Make sense? Not reply to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you know, if you don't write by your hand, you would say, oh, I understand this, oh, move forward. You know? So you have to follow the same steps. Then by your hand, you'll make a mistakes. Then you will learn. This is just like one time shot, you know, I'm just telling you how you use it. But after that, we'll move forward with smooth stuff. Plus, you know, I've been talking for, from 11.30, you know? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Professor about that. Do you think we can have like an instead of finishing half an hour early, can we have like fifteen minutes break in the middle? Because like three hours straight is a little bit like too much to take. Uh soon we will do this because you know on, on Wednesday you guys will come, as I said, every ten minutes you guys so a group will come and present to me the work. For the for the lab. What about Mondays? 
Mondays, you know, I, you can be released early by 50 minutes. Make sense? Or maybe like one in the middle instead. <laughs> you want to vote on it? No. <laughs> you just want it, to make sure. It was painful with big and a sign, you know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, Professor, just huh. as a question for the scope of the class. Do we eventually get into like IPs and the SDK? Or no? Oh, that's a that's a higher level of this. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna tell you how. You know, I'm gonna show also IP for those, but that's a trick. You know, it's like extra thing. So now I'm generating a bit stream. Have you noticed something? implementation finished and it says here the power we are consuming with this such a design including the including the logic analyzer 0 0.125 but look at the number of the lookup table jump to what 3000 something have you noticed because this is the logic analyzer so it's basically you know subtract four from all of this and subtract one from the number flip flop this is net for the logic analyzer And here, see the worst slack, and you know the worst holding slack, and stuff like that. That's also logic analyze. But it's a cheaper way for you to do it while you are in this pandemic thing. Uh, to uh, look into the activity of the lab using embedded logic analyzer on the chip, and instead of wasting money on buying a new one, right? Professor? Yes, sir. Oh, while it's loading, uh, could you elaborate more on the quiz we have coming up? The quizzes? Y yeah, do we have one next week? I think you mentioned it earlier. We should have something. It's in the syllabus, right? Mm -hmm. No, nah, dude, the first quiz is on week six. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, look at the syllabus, please. So now we know everything is ready. We just need to see what its this logic analyzer look like, right? I need a wire. Ah. Which wire is this? Which wire is that? I think one of them was really bad. So, let's see. I'm losing wires in this office. Wires, please, wire, come here, wire. I need a new wire. Take it from this board. Okay. So now we are wiring it to the dock station here. Connecting it to the board. So here's the board. Turn on. Everybody see it? Now it's just running the old default what? Running the old default what? Uh, design on the Q flash in the that you know Digiland have it for demonstration. So now I just say uh, open hardware manager, and I say open target auto connect. Some of you sometimes will have a problem of connecting, and ninety percent of it is a problem with the wire. It happened to me a lot, and then you know I changed the wire. Then it says here program device. It's identified that you know Digilint. It's there with XDC file monitor and everything. So say project manager here. Look before while I'm streaming, it was just a bit stream file. Now there is another file. It's called debug prop file, which is for the logic analyzer. I say program. And what the screen popped out in front of you is the logic analyzer. Did you see this? Can you see in front of you the waveform in front of you now? That's a logic analyzer. Sounds good? 
we can start play with any number we want, right? So we said the first four are representing the A, and the second are representing the B, and the select representing the, the select, right? So imagine that I would like the first one to have maybe 14. So one, two, three. And the second one will have uh, three on it. If the selector is zero, it's gonna be 14. If the selector is one, it will tend to be to be three. Do you agree? But it's not cool to see it something like that. So what we can do, we can just go ahead. Can you see my cursor? Run trigger. And keep it running all the time. So what you see in front of you is what? C3, 3E, right? So that was the input. That was the second input. And the output based on the selector when what? E. So I'm going to change it and you can look to the screen. Look at the screen. What will happen? Now it should be the output 3. The output E, I'm sorry. Did you see the output? I click again, it will be converted to three. Turn it to be three. Do you agree? Are you guys following me? So now you, now you have a logic analyzer. Uh, I had a quick question. Sure, sir. Um, so wait, what's controlling the, the refreshes? Uh, there is a way to do it, actually. The refresh rate, you mean. See, it say here, there is a way to refresh rate to change it. Uh, let me find it to you. Here, setting. Look, everything here. Number of windows, whatever. Uh, width of the depth of data. Here's the highest I choose, you remember? The regular position of this, here's the value. The refresh rate, you want it to be 500 or do you want it to be 5,000 maybe? And so on. But you have to stop while doing this, say stop. I stopped, right? I can just say refresh every 50 milliseconds, right? Then I will go ahead and say run trigger. It will wait a little bit. I will change now. I completely change, but I'm waiting too much longer, right? Until the refreshment happened. After a while, the refreshment will happen now and it change the value to you to be three as an output. So you need your eyes to look into the output here. And also to the test, because then, you know, the test, it went up high, right? This here is zero. So we have to wait to 5,000 5, seconds until it will go, you know, something like that. So now see, it tend to be what? One in the test and three in the output. Let me change it again. So I'm changing it. Uh, it wait a little bit, it's change it by itself. So that's from the, from the rate in front of you. You uh, agree? Yeah, thank you. It's super cool uh, thing. And also, you know, you can make number of window actually. You would like to see more data? So I'm gonna stop here in front of you. Stop, 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 stop. You have to click a lot on it because you know, it's faster than your, your hand, you know? Now, instead of this, you can just say, I want it to be uh, 1024 right number of windows and then you know you can come and say okay run this is window see this window of time so i kind of change now and i ask to see the window of time show me the window of time some of the window of time is actually not e not three some of them is is, is three you know as fast as you are by your hand you know you can just go ahead and say fit. And then you know you can just go ahead and expose it again. You understand what I'm doing now? Is it clear, guys? Clear? Not clear? That's clear. Super. The rest of the people. Yeah, it's clear. Okay. Now I'm going to show you something even more fun. As I promised, you know, I promised to do a lot of stuff. So anyway, you stop here.
do the stuff. Okay. Then, you know, I go in here and XADC system. XADC system. I click on it and I say, I want to see the, the whole system. Say yes. And from there, I can see also the clock. Here is the clock in front of you. I can just also add the clock also. I don't know where is the clock. Oh, did you take the clock in the other hand? Oh, here. Look, what is this? This is the temperature life now inside the chip. So what I can do, I can actually ask the analyzer. Uh, where are you analyzer? Where did you go analyzer? Run analyzer. So now the analyzer is running, right? And you say the value is going to be from zero to one, right? Because you know, I'm looking for what the positive edge, negative edge, positive edge, negative edge. So I can just go in and see here. Um, keep it changing reversibly. R, 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 R. I want to see the value here. One second. Here, see? So now because I'm running, the temperature is going up and down. I can put my hand on it. Look what will happen. Change, right? I move my hand. See the temperature is going 39.C, whatever, whatever, right? And here's some other stuff like voltage regulation. You would like to see the voltage happening while you know you are processing data inside the analyzer. I want to do something which is more fun. And um, here is going to be here. So let's play a little bit and make some changes. See, I'm, I'm just playing with, the, with my switches, right? So to do more, more work. Temperature is going up to uh, 3.5, point down, then, you know, 3.4 and so on. If I have more like more aggressive uh, thing, it can go up to the 47 to 68 uh, Celsius. So is it clear to everybody what I have done so far? So do you think FPGA is fun uh, thing to learn or how to learn? It's both and hard. Okay, hard. Yeah, well, I don't think it's, it's not easy. <laughs> how hard your exams are. <laughs> and it takes a while to learn, I think. Yeah. Don't worry about my exams. If you understand this, you know, my exams will be a piece of cake, right? One of the way that I told you, I write, I write a code and I tell you, if you take this code and you synthesize it, give me the circuit. Or maybe I can give you the circuit until you write the code. Then you have to do the same follow strip. You know, you're gonna do the RTL, this bench, all the whole thing. And you don't forget, Sean, you know, my exam is not like one hour. It's the whole day, maybe. Okay. Now, I want to show you something uh, in, very interesting, which is the, uh, clock divider. How can you make a clock divider? Clock dividers can happen with multiple things. I don't think we're gonna have too much time left in the lecture because this should be end up by two fifteen, right? Is it? I think it's isn't it right? It's two fifteen, right? So maybe we can try one one way to um, 
make a clock dividers, and then you know the rest of it will be next time. So I'm gonna stop everything here. Boom, boom. Stop, stop. I didn't see you again. See you. Have a go. One of the way, let's start a new project. So, you know, uh, one of the way is to use the uh, IPs as uh, Mario was asking. So if you have an IP and SDK, those are very fun actually, but um, hopefully we can touch base some of this concept. So I'm gonna call here and say, you know, clock divider, Provider IP, so based on IP technology. So I'm gonna say next, I'm gonna say next, and everybody remember XC7, uh, no XC, you remember it was X what? 7800 uh, CS, ECS. Next, finished. I'm gonna just show you the simulation, and not simulation, because simulation there is very hard, and it needs an upgraded version of model sim, which is made by a company, it's called uh, Mentor Graphics, which is a part of uh, Siemens. The, the software they're using is called Model Sim Cuesta. But we are not having it now. It's it's a very pricey uh, license. But um, let's see. So imagine that you know I would like to generate a clock higher than the hundred megahertz. Even my XDC is giving me hundred megahertz. In that case, what should I do? Somebody tell me. What should I do? Can you repeat the question, please? The XDC file is giving me 100 megahertz. And when the XDC file is given 100 megahertz, that means the internal clock inside the FPGA is 100 megahertz. A certain design I built, like the one I built while I was working for a scientist for Illinois, it was running up to 400 megahertz. But my board is 100 megahertz. What should I do? So basically, this is not need in clock divider. This is need clock amplification. So there is a tool we can use for giving me both clock divider up to a certain range and clock uh, amplification. That's called PLL, which is the phase locked loop circuit. It's an ASIC analog circuit on the board. We can instantiate it using the IP catalog. So that's called IP catalog. So you click an IP catalog like this. Everybody, please follow me on what I'm doing. And then I would just say here clock, and I will pick up the clock wizard. Clocking wizard, this one. In there, you have two different options. You have MMCM, and if you remember in the beginning of the lecture, we had six units of the MMCM which is going up to 800 megahertz, or you can use the PLL up to 500 megahertz. So I can just go ahead and say I want the PLL. Then, which one is gonna be the coming from the XTC? It's gonna be the clock end. Which one is coming out of the XTC? This one, out. So for instance, you can, in one shot of one PLL, you can generate up to six, six clock in a different range from one clock you have. Would you imagine that? Six of them. Each of them can be indifferent. Can be different of what? My input was 100 megahertz. How can I go? Maybe I can go to nine megahertz. It can go nine megahertz. It can go to six megahertz. No. So the PLL allow you to go from 100 megahertz up to what? 
seven, seven watts megahertz. It is attenuation, right? You go down from 100 to seven, but also you can change the seven to be 400. So you are taking 100 and you are giving me 400. What is the usage of multiple clock outputs you can think? There is something that's very complicated and I don't think I'm gonna cover in this particular introduction course. It's called design clock domains. So you know, your circuit pieces will be running in different clock. And that's called multi-clock domain approach. It's very complicated to maintain the coherency and the synchronization between pieces inside the whole design. Okay, so anyway, imagine that I just want a 400 megahertz. I did like 400 megahertz. Then I have a reset and I have something that's called locked. What does locked mean? Locked mean that the clock, the output of the clock coming from this block in the beginning will be not stable. So it's not giving me 400 in the beginning. So at the time the clock is not stable, that lock is gonna be like a flag, will be down. That means don't use this clock at this time until the lock will be equal one. That means that that time the 400 is happening. Do you guys follow me? Do you guys understand what I said so far? Did you understand so far what I'm saying? So by locking it, it's, it's at 100, and then it, it goes to 400. Yeah, so in the, your input is 100. Your input is 100. The output is 400. That output wire coming out of the PLL in the beginning will not be in a steady state. It will be in a transition. It can be any number between 100 and 400. So you cannot use it in your circuit. That means your circuit can explode or something wrong can happen, especially if you are designing something for space application, like a cube satellite. So then, you know, you need a signal like a flag. This flag, when it's low, that means this clock don't use. It stay asleep until this flag will go up. When the flag will go up, you know, you will go directly to what to use it. Make sense? Mm. I'm gonna show you some trick and then next time I will go in details, okay? So that's 400 reset. I would just say, uh, okay, port renaming. I don't want to rename anything. PLL setting, it's, I love it so far. And then, you know, output here. Maybe I can just call the clock here as a clock N1. I can just say clock, uh, I just give a name, XBC. I'm just giving a name. And I say, okay. Okay, to create the directory of the, la -la -la of the IP. What will happen now, it's going to synthesize and everything and give you a ready IP, you will put it inside your, instantiate it inside your design. And that will be covered by the lecture on Monday. Do you guys have any questions so far? Um, so these clocks are, are it's just a single uh, signal, no? But I know that there's an option is with the clock wizard that you can get a differential signal? It, which is the MMCM. Oh. The differential is gonna be the MMCM. This one is a single one, the PLL, which is the phase uh, uh, locked loop. What's, what's the MMCM do again? What, what's the use of that? MM, MM, MMCM, that means there is two, two clock source and you're taking differences between of them and it approaches really high frequencies and PLL. Hmm. But it's- okay. It's very hard to maintain the synchronization. So that's why, you know, you have to use it in a very different environment. Oh, okay. Because you are seeking like 800 megahertz, 700 megahertz. It's really quite high for such a small board like the Nexus 4 we have. There is another option, which is you have a crystal and you connect it to one of this pen P mod and you push it in and you will have an external clock generator. But that's really very, very um, customized for a certain application. It's not into the course scope. But at least you should know that you can do. Make sense? Any other questions? On the XDC file, are all available pins shown to us? 
are there some yes, pins sir. that aren't all mentioned? All the, all the available pins are available to us. So let me let me grab it again in front of you. Uh, one second. Uh, FCC file of Nexus for DDR. Uh, open the GitHub. Add. Uh, create Nexus for DDR. And then you know, finish. What is this? Uh, one second, please. So look, in XDC file, you can access the internal clock. In XDC file, you can access the switch. In XDC file, you can access the LED or the colored LED. In XDC file, you can access the seven segment display. In XDC file, you can access the buttons. In XDC file, you can access the one, two, the five P mods, each P mod in front of you, A, B, C, D, and it has names on front of you. The XDC file have ADC in one of the P mods, so you can push uh, analog signals and again convert it to digital. In XDC files, you have VGA connector. In XDC file, you have also SD connectors for microphone and a micro USB. And accelerometers, you know, if you put it like, you know, checking the gravity and the uh, orientations, and also it has a temperature sensor, so you can very clear see it's on the far right side nearby the switch. It's called temp sensor. In XDC file, you also have the uh, omnidirection microphone, and it have audio amplifiers, and if you have uh, serial communicators, USB and HDI, high definition, and you have ethernet, and also have communication with the flash SPI interface. So you have many things you can connect to this available XTC. Any other question? Just to be sure before I, I leave, if everything in this course, I mean, it is, so far is clear or not? Is the material is clear or not? I, I think it's pretty clear so far. I think uh, seeing the first assignment will put everything in perspective. Exactly, I mean, first assignment would be, yeah, you need practice, exactly. You need to practice and then you know the assignment will be coming soon so during the uh, maybe tomorrow or so i will be sending emails say that you know you have from now until wednesday and in wednesday you will be presenting your work and loading everything in github that makes sense so you're gonna have a room of one week to work and in wednesday you will be coming to present your work in a team and of course, the team will be A, the first 10 minutes, B, the second 10 minutes, and so on. That's what you said, next Wednesday? Again, the coming Wednesday. Okay. Oh, we require a, a PowerPoint for the presentation. Yes, you're gonna make like a three, four slides. Yeah, it's not a big number. Right? All right. Of course, the demo will be with you, ready. Yeah. Right? And all of you will be talking, so you know, that's why I want you as a team in front of me in this 10 minutes. It's designed for the, for the team, just you. And then you, okay. you finish your 10 minutes, the second group will be the second 10 minutes, the third group will be the third 10 minutes and so on. Sounds good. Thank okay, you. sounds fair. Thank you guys. I wish you a wonderful time. Stay safe, God bless you. And I hope everything is clear don't forget you have the office hour if you have any questions you know just book a uh, book an appointment with me on the during the office hour with the calendly look at the syllabus and follow it uh, and you know i'm following the syllabus as well and i wish you guys all the best thank you and have a great day thank, thank you professor. professor thank you professor bye-bye